So thing six was China is back and has returned to its rightful place as a natural leader of Asia and as a world power once more. And I've been lecturing about China for a decade or two, and that used to be about it. I would say, okay, those are the six things you need. But the times they are changing, and they're changing even faster than I thought they were going to for China and the world. And so I'm actually going to add a number seven. So thing seven you need to know, and this is so new. This is the first time I've openly lectured about it. Thing seven is that China is now flexing its financial, political, and military muscle out to the rest of the world. And that's new. They've not done that before. They certainly haven't done it in the modern era. And it's hard to see even historically when they've had so much impact out onto, intentionally, onto the rest of the world. What am I referencing here? I'm telling you, it's hot and it's new. It's evolving rapidly, even faster than I thought it was going to. I mean, everybody knew that China was eventually going to get rich. It's a billion and a half people. It's a lot of pent up energy and a workforce and a willingness to want to do more. So it was a foregone conclusion that they will be the world's largest economy. Everybody's kind of known it for a while now. It's the other elements that are surprising to us that they are evolving so rapidly as China expressing itself as a world power in other ways. Here's what I'm talking about. We've already referenced the economic and financial stuff in some detail, so I can just summarize quickly. China spent the late 70s to the early 90s putting its house in order, getting things on a market economy path. And then by the 1990s and the 2000s, they were regaining their role as a manufacturing giant, uh, a gargantuan manufacturing giant on planet Earth and getting rich. And then they proceeded to diversify even further into service sector stuff, quaternary level activities, research stuff, highest levels of technology, the whole nine yards, making more money, more money, more money. We all got that. And then in the 2010s, they started expanding their economic clout to financial institutions around the world. And I referenced that the last lecture. The, again, now we're into now time. And this is new. China has not done even the financial institutions of the world stuff until here in the 21st century. But now they're turning a whole new page on regaining their world power status. And again, even quicker than I or most have imagined. Finance, economic stuff, we got it. They're rich. Okay. Uh, with money that does buy you power, at least a doorway into the halls of power, and China has kicked that door in and they're moving rapidly. Now, this has happened so much quicker than uh, most of us anticipated, I think, primarily because of a leader that's now in power, and I've referenced him already as well, and that's the new or the current uh, a president of China, President Xi Jinping, uh, in office since November 2012, so basically since 2013. Uh, and this guy, she, woo, he is a, a beast, a, a whole new beast of a different dragon altogether and has taken China to the next level. How should I put it? A, a dragon of a different color, let's say. Xi has been legitimizing the authority of the Communist Party, introducing far-ranging measures to enforce party discipline and ensure internal unity. Read into that tightening control of internal dissent, maybe even tightening control of the press a little bit, tightening control of the internet a little bit, uh, and basically reminding everybody in China, hey, don't forget, we're the Communist Party, and even though we're really rich and really capitalistic and really out in the world now, we're still the Communist Party, and we're still large and in charge of this place. Don't forget about that, okay? We ain't going to have no spiraling off into democra uh, democratic institutions anytime soon. We still got this. You guys have been happy. You've been getting richer. Everything's cool. We have strong national pride. And we took you there. And we are still in charge. Uh, now, that's not to say that he's smashing everything with an iron fist. No, no, no. He's a savvy politician. And he's a popular politician. People love him now. Just like they loved the president before him. 
former President Hu Jintao and uh, Premier Wen Jiabao, the two guys in charge before Xi and his crew got in, they were beloved as well. But they went out into the world and, and uh, uh, rode this economic tide that China was growing that whole decade and were making nice with the world and having trade deals and, and uh, introducing China to the world and the world to China. And they were happy, happy, joy, joy. Xi is much more kind of by the books. No, no, we're here, we're China, we're a world power now, and we're behaving as such. Happy time over. Let's get real with some other stuff here. Now, one of the things he's done internally right from the get-go is he said, well, we're going to have an unprecedented far-reaching campaign to fight out corruption. Because, yes, there are problems at home. Yes, we're getting richer. Yes, everything's pretty good at home. But uh, people are unhappy. They're unhappy about, say, environmental uh, conditions. We're going to deal with that. They're unhappy about corruption. And they want law and order for everyone from top to bottom. And so she is undertaking this, whoo, unprecedented program of rooting out corrupt leaders within the communist political party and party bosses and even businesses. And they have arrested high level, super rich people and thrown them in jail and took all their stuff. They ain't playing around. On top of that corruption campaign, which he truly has terrorized <laughs> the, the, the upper echelons of the communist party and business people everywhere into falling into line and doing the right thing for China. On top of that, he's pushing further economic reforms capital, uh, market capitalism, uh, economic reforms, uh, and governing uh, according to the rule of law and order. Again, heavy on the justice thing with the corruption, but they're still pushing that society to do more, all right? Now, that's one thing. But the other thing that makes him powerful is that he, uh, President Xi Jinping, has significantly centralized institutional power to himself and, and to the party, but to himself a bit. Now, I'm not suggesting he's becoming a dictator. He's not pulling a Vladimir Putin just as yet. But he has taken on the chairmanship of not just the president and the, top, and the top head of the Communist Party, but even things like the newly formed National Security Commission. He's in charge of that as well, and a whole bunch of other steering committees on economic and social reforms, and even military reforms, and internet reforms. Yeah, she's kind of making sure that he's in charge of everything and his input is in it and it's going the way he wants it to go. Now, to finish off this thing seven of how China particularly is pushing its influence out of China into the rest of the world, is that she has taken a particularly hard line stance on security issues and foreign affairs, uh, projecting a much more nationalistic and assertive China on the world stage than we have seen from China for some time. Now, you can look back in, in Chinese history of the last couple hundred years, or let's just say the last 60 or 70. Yeah, Mao Zedong was a very popular world figure, a very popular figure inside of China. But he wasn't projecting power outward. He was trying to project a powerful uh, uh, united China, but he wasn't projecting that power anywhere else, well, except that Korean War thing. Xi is here saying, oh, no, uh, yeah, we have not only our act together, we're more powerful than most of you people, and we know it, and we're going to start behaving that way. She has championed a more assertive foreign policy, particularly, and jot these things down, a very assertive foreign policy in, in kind of four different ways in relations to Sino-Japanese relations, which have gone sour since she took over, uh, China's claim to the South China Sea, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, involvement in Asian regional affairs, meaning that they're pushing themselves to be the leader of virtually all the trade blocks and social blocks and Asian blocks, anything that exists, China wants to be in the middle of it. And finally, even challenging the United States of America uh, to it, what China perceives as U.S. encroaching influence in the Western Pacific Ocean and in Asia in general. So China is working exceptionally hard over time to expand its influence out to the rest of Asia and the world and minimize the United States' influence, particularly in what it considers its neighborhood, its hood, its backyard, or its front yard, if you want to consider the Western Pacific in that respect. So a much, much, much more aggressive uh, foreign policy approach than anyone maybe ever in Chinese history. I, I, you know, I'm prone to exaggeration, but... China's been around a long time. We've stressed that a million times. And China's known about the world this whole time. But China's never really sent out 
uh, navies and militaries to conquer foreign lands. It's never had aspirations to do that. It mostly takes care of itself, takes care of its peeps, takes care of its own, makes sure that it has the most advantageous economic relations with everyone around it and in the world. But it's pretty, pretty much has stayed kind of inward focused. This is the first time, I think, that you can really look at this country and say, they are intentionally pushing out and they're doing it here in the 21st century, the first perhaps full century of globalized relations where China sees itself in the middle of this going, we are going to influence other things in other parts of the world financially, economically, and perhaps even politically and militarily by expressing perhaps raw power out from the state. How so? Then now let's get to some nuts and bolts. They're going to revamp their military. Okay, I referenced this already when one of Xi's priorities is, yeah, we're going to redo a lot of the components of our uh, country, including the military. Now, they already for decades have been pouring money into the Chinese equivalent of NASA, which is the China National Space Administration, the CNSA. Uh, and I've already told you they have goals on putting a man, a human, on the moon by 2020 or 2030. Uh, they are going to have some sort of space colony. They have uh, a, a joint relation with Russia and a joint planned uh, to Mars trip, Russia-China grouping. So just looking at the face of that, China has been working over time already, now for decades, into proving that it's a big boy country too in pushing its power into outer space. They've simultaneously been doing this for inner space, I know I'm crazy. I, I, I say things so interestingly, don't I? Meaning that you probably have heard a news story or a million about China's hacking prowess, which is that their cyber warfare is some of the best in the world. They've hacked everybody everywhere already 10 times over. And not just government targets, not even just US government targets, they've attacked uh, US private businesses and stolen secrets all over the place. So. They are quite adept at pushing their influence out in through the networks and the wavelengths and the intrawebs and all that stuff too. Now, before I make fun of uh, China's hacking prowess too much, uh, and you know, there are, who knows how many hundreds of thousands or hundreds to hundreds of thousands of hackers China has in the country. Who knows how many of those are actually working for the government. <laughs> it's a safe bet it's a bunch of them, right? But at the same time, the U.S. does all that stuff too. You never hear those stories in the United States. But U.S. hackers, they also do cyber warfare and attack other places. So do Israeli hackers. So do South African hackers. So do Russian hackers. So China is already on the forefront of the next wave of military-style attacks, cyber warfare. So they're in outer space. They're in inner space. But... Most of us deal in real space here, so let's talk about that for the remainder. And that is, conventionally, militarily speaking, what's going on in China. Uh, she and his crew have said, boom, we're overhauling our whole true blue military, all branches. We, uh, China already has the largest standing army on planet Earth. That is, the largest number of people in boots and uniforms with guns. The largest number of humans. The deal is, though, and that's the army, okay? They've got the biggest army. But they have a navy and an air force and a marines. they got all the other stuff that everybody else has. So the thing with the army is that China is a, land, a, a classic land power. Uh, and they have secured most of their borders. And they're becoming more friendly even with the Russians, who I think they share the largest border with. So most of their borders are already secure. It doesn't appear that there's going to be any land war. So the Chinese know this, and they're like, eh. Do we really need to have this gigantic uh, physical armed force? We need to streamline. So you're likely going to see them streamline their army much the exact way the United States already has, have fewer soldiers, but then high-tech them up big time and, of course, continue to fund cyber warfare. So army overhaul is going to see a smaller force that has much greater capacity to do damage, faster, better technology, better guns. They're going to keep building bigger guns and missiles, and they're going to keep producing probably nuclear stuff to keep their nuclear arsenal up to, uh, to uh, a par. But they're also going to be spending a lot more money for, on their air force to project air power, to protect their airspace. That goes without saying. Those things seem pretty important. 
airplanes that carry bombs or missiles that carry themselves to other parts of the planet. They're going to do all of that to revamp all their old technology, get all newer stuff. Because they got tons of capital to do it with, by the way. The thing I want you to consider more closely, actually, is the Navy. Oft overlooked, because people are like, boats? Well, who cares about boats anymore? We're just send an airplane over there and bomb somebody. Uh, maybe? Uh, the Navy is pretty darn important, though, especially when you have a really huge coastline, especially when you want to project your power outside of your very large coastline. So look, you heard it here first, put it in your head, look for China to invest perhaps the most in their Navy. Now, they already have gunboats and warships and, and stuff like that, and they have one aircraft carrier, maybe two now. I don't know if the two, the second one has already been launched and it's out doing its maiden runs and stuff. Uh, if they don't have their second one on the water yet, it's well on its way. By the time you see this video, just assume they already have two aircraft carriers. Now, why do I always harp on aircraft carriers? Uh, and, and by the way, they're going to continue to build more warships and gunboats and small ones and big ones, and they're going to produce more aircraft carriers. The United States, of course, is the, the giant when it comes to the military on planet Earth. And the United States has more aircraft carriers than the whole rest of the world put together. And most other countries are getting rid of their aircraft carriers. China's going to have more. They're probably going to keep building aircraft carriers until they have as many as the United States does. Bam! Again, you heard it here first. So why am I harping on aircraft carriers? Because you probably know this from a former lecture, aircraft carriers are quite important in that they are a true projection of power to anywhere else on planet Earth. Yes, you can put a, a, a jet up in the air and fly somewhere and drop a bomb. Jets can only go so far without being refueled, and there's airspace, and you're jacking it shot down and stuff of that nature. An aircraft carrier is a piece of your sovereign state that you can physically move to off the coast of another country and have 20 jets on it then can then go bomb uh, that place. So it is a true and real and raw projection of power elsewhere outside of your land territory. And China is going to keep building them faster than any other country on planet Earth. Why? To project power, raw power, and in a couple of very distinct ways or reasons that China is doing this. They're going to project power abroad. I do not believe in your lifetime, well, let's say in my lifetime, I don't think we're going to see uh, China projecting its power to, say, the other side of the planet to go get involved in a war in the Middle East. That ain't their style. They're going to project their power abroad into the Pacific and their neighborhood, uh, at least into the watery territories that China considers their outright property, or at the very least, their strategic buffer zones. So we're talking mostly islands off the coast of China. Hello, Taiwan. Uh, and the greater Western Pacific, which they see as, hey, geopolitically, that's our front yard. We got to protect it. It's kind of ours. It's important to us. So the water around them, but also the air above that water. Now, wait, we're not talking about air. Dig this, my friends, and I'm going to reference a whole bunch of different news stories and particular items I'll tell you to write down that you should research in more detail, but hopefully I'm giving you enough background on it really quickly that you understand what they mean when you hear them in the news, because you're going to hear a bunch about these in the news in the coming years. Back to the air, though. Back in November 2013, hey, that's just a year after uh, Xi Jinping took power. Uh, in November 2013, the Chinese government declared the East China Sea Air Def Defense Identification Zone. <laughs> Such a mouthful. Let me try to slow that down. East China Sea. Okay, that's a body of water. The East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. And what that means is that China said, we're carving off a big chunk of the air <laughs> over the East China Sea that's uh, hundreds of miles off the coast of China, and we're pretending as if it's ours. It's our air. So we're going to need anyone who flies in that air to ask permission from China before you do it, or we might have to shoot you out of the uh, uh, air. So if you have a uh, military vehicle in the air, if you don't ask us permission, we'll shoot you down. Even if you have a passenger a plane over there and you don't communicate with us, you don't ask us to come into our airspace, we will shoot you down. This was called, this caused much consternation. I, I, I meant to tell you this later, but I'll go ahead and tell you now because it's funny. 
uh, the 24 hours after China announced this, this air zone, uh, the United States flew a B-52 bomber around. It went, wee! Hi, China, hi! We're not asking permission for this. Why would China do this and why is this problematic? T trying to claim the air? Well, yes, countries control the air over their territories. You can't just fly an airplane anywhere you want to willy-nilly on planet Earth. You cross over an international border and unless the people know you're coming, you're going to get shot down by somebody, especially Russia or China or the United States. So, yes, the airspace directly above your land is kind of your territory and everybody kind of recognizes that. The ocean, though, is much more nebulous. And how much of that airspace you want to claim out into the water is now becoming a matter of some debate. And the reason this caused consternation is because uh, about half this area that China claimed as their East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone was already claimed as part of Japan's airspace and its Air Defense Identification Zone. So you start to see why this is a little tricky. Now, it gets even trickier when we start talking about islands and who owns territorial waters and how far out they do. So let me give you just this very quick primer. Let me throw up this map. Here's how it works so far on planet Earth. Uh, the, the, the countries of the world have been debating about this for decades and said, well, how much of the water do, does everybody own? Most of the, our blue planet is water, and most of that water is what we call international waters. It's a free-for-all. Nobody owns it. There's no laws. Do whatever you want. I always tell students, uh, you want to drink legally or gamble or do whatever you want to do, just get a few hundred miles off of the coast anywhere. Do what you want. There's no law out there. But the countries of the world got together at the United Nations, and they basically have this thing that I'm going to refer to as the law of the sea. And everybody says, okay, we kind of all agree to this. <laughs> With one exception, by the way. The United States is one of the few countries that has not signed this treaty yet. I know. Why ask why? you got to go look it up yourself. We're talking about China, and it's, it's expressing its power outside of its borders. Back to this brief talk, though. The land that your sovereign state owns, land we all get, right? We draw political borders. The land inside of that, it's sovereign, it's yours. You control it, you, have, you control the resources on it, above it. Uh, you control the airspace above it. You control the resources under it. You create the laws for it. You control it, you got that. What happens when you hit the coast? Everyone's agreed that 12 nautical miles from your coastline is pretty much your land as well. Yes, it's water, uh, but just treat it like land. It's territorial waters, which means you own it. You own the air above it. You own the resources underneath of it. If any of your citizens are swimming out in it, you control them too. Your law goes into your territorial waters. Your ownership and your law of your state goes into the 12 nautical miles off your coast. Then there's this other uh, more nebulous 12 nautical miles after that, which is a contiguous zone. And in this further 12 nautical mile contiguous zone, the state can continue to enforce laws in four specific areas, namely customs, taxation, immigration, and pollution. So even though it's technically not territory, their laws, uh, whatever country you're off the coast of, still apply. So now let's call it up to 24 nautical miles out. So you can't be messing around 12 to 24 nautical miles out and think you're free and clear. No, you're still subject to the laws of the country you're off the coast of. After that, though, it's pretty much international waters, except for this one last thing I want you to jot down, and that is from your coastline for 200 nautical miles out is something called an exclusive economic zone. And in the exclusive economic zone, which of course would in include the 12 nautical miles of territorial waters and the 12 nautical miles of contiguous water, in this 200 nautical mile zone out, the country whose coastline it is has exclusive economic uh, exploitation rights over all the natural resources in that water and under it. So all the fish in it and any of the oil or natural gas or anything that would be mined out from 200 miles out to the coast, that's also belonging exclusively to the country. Nobody can go in there and fish without asking their permission. Here's the kicker, though, that you throw an asterisk in for. Foreign nations have the right of the uh, freedom of navigation and overflight in these areas up to uh, that 12 nautical mile zone, okay? Subject to the regulation of the states whose coast that is. Th was that too much for you? I, 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 
telling you it's important for the rest of the stuff I'm getting ready to say here. So 12 nautical miles off the coast, that's definitely the countries. Other foreign craft can mess around in the contiguous zone, but they have to pay attention to laws for up to the next 12 miles. And you can mess around after that, but you'll have to ask permission to fish there or to mine there or do other things like that. And typically, countries can fly their planes over it or run their boats through it. Typically, nobody cares. But the world does say, yeah, but you should ask for permission because that country can put up some laws and you are subject to the regulation of that state in that 200-mile border zone. Does that make sense? Now go back to that story I just told you about, the East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. China's pushing this. They're saying, hey, territorially, this is about within a couple hundred miles or so, and it's important to us. So we're writing a law that says the airspace above it, above it now you have to ask us permission. Again, the United, Japan said, we're not paying attention to that. Uh, it actually intersected some Korean airspace, and Korea said, we're not paying attention to that. And the United States intentionally flew a plane in, in plane into it to say, we're not recognizing that. That was just phase one, though. That's just the airspace. This is that one thing over the uh, uh, East China Sea. There's way bigger fish to fry here in some conflicts that are going down based on the stuff I just taught you. This has inflamed other territorial issues now. And again, an aggressive China is taking up the mantle to fight these territorial issues much more aggressively than before. And I do want you to know, at least in reference, the Senkaku Islands off the coast of China, which kind of belong to Japan. The Senkaku Islands are also named the Daeyu Islands by China. So in Chinese, it's Daeyu. In Japanese, it's Senkaku. It's a cluster of uninhabited rocks a couple hundred miles off the coast of China. Uh, in fact, it's located approximately 120 nautical miles northeast of Taiwan. So Taiwan has some sort of claim on it too. Uh, 120 miles uh, northeast of Taiwan, 200 nautical miles east of uh, China, and 200 nautical miles southwest of the Japanese island of Okinawa. All three of these entities say that this group of rocks is ours. Now again, who the hell cares about a group of rocks? Truly, it's a group of rocks. Five or six outcroppings. Birds hang out there. That's it. There's no humans on it. Well, when you start to apply this UN convention that I've now taught you, if you control those rocks, then you also control 12 nautical miles in all directions around those rocks. And China, a more powerful, assertive China, looks at this group of rocks and says, this is bull stuff. These rocks are uh, with, uh, within their 200-mile uh, economic zone, for starters. Much more important, if Japan claims they own 12 miles around all these rocks, they could set up a nuclear missile and point it at us, and it's just a couple hundred miles off our coast, and that's too close. And guess what? Japan took these rocks from China back in the 1895 Sino-Japanese War. Hello, remember that? Look how I do it. I cast way out there for historical fact. I taught you a couple lectures ago and then reel you right back into it. So Japan held on to this group of nonsensical rocks even after World War II, and it's now causing some consternation because China says, hey dudes, those are ours. Uh, many spats now have been fought over this group of rocks in just the last couple of years. The airspace around them is now contested. Again, if you, if it's just a rock, but if you own this rock, you own 12 miles in each direction and you own the airspace above it. So Japan says, hey, those are ours, and we're gonna keep flying our airplanes over it to prove it's ours, and we will keep sending you a uh, Japanese Coast Guard to go around it to prove to you that it's ours. And now the Chinese, just in the last couple of years, have said, ah, oh, we don't think so. So we're sending our airplanes to fly around it, and we're going to send our boats. We're going to send fishing boats right up beside it and fish. Take that, Japan. So this is one of the things that has started to sour relations big time between these two Asian economic titans. Remember, China's the second biggest or first biggest economy on planet Earth. Japan's number three. Does anybody really want to see a war break out between these two juggernauts over a group of rocks. Nobody really wants to see it, but it might happen. Everybody's very proud here. 
The Japanese are proud. The Chinese are proud. There have been protests in both countries about this group of rocks. It's going to go down. China will end up grabbing them and then challenging the Japanese to take them back. And who knows what the United States will do. Although for the U.S., for its part, usually every now and again flies a B-52 bomber around this group of rocks. I tell you, it just keeps happening. It'll come back again in a minute. Hang on. Because I'm laughing about uh, these, uh, this uh, Senkaku Island spat. Uh, remember also, even though it's a rock, if there's oil underneath of it, then you'd own that oil too, 12 miles in all directions. So possibly there's oil there, possibly there's other resources, but it certainly is a geopolitical strategic group of rocks for China. They're bothered that a country that they don't like could set up shop uh, and a, you know, a, a, a missile 200 miles off their coast, point at them. Fair enough in terms of their assessment of that. That's actually not even the big deal. There have been much bigger uh, uh, spats that are going down now south of all of this mess, and it's that Senkaku group of rocks isn't even the only group of rocks that the folks are fighting about, particularly China. The much bigger claim over a much bigger area and a much bigger group of rocks is down in the South China Sea. East China Sea is where we just were. South China Sea is where I'm talking about now. And the South China Sea has a small group of islands off the coast of Vietnam called the Paracel Islands. A much bigger grouping of islands called the Spratly Islands, which are down in the south off the coast of Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia. Uh, and let me just go ahead and cut to the chase because this has taken too long already. China is claiming not just the Paracel Islands, not just the Spratly Islands. They're claiming the entire South China Sea, all of it lock, stock, and barrel. China's claim, and sometimes it's called the Nine Dash Line Maritime Claim. You can go Google that. It really goes right off the coast of the Philippines, all the way down to Malaysia, Brunei, and up through around uh, Vietnam. Multiple countries have claims in the South China Sea based simply on the 12 nautical mile or the 200 uh, uh, nautical mile exclusive economic zone that most of the countries on planet Earth pay attention to. And so you have Vietnam, Brunei, Malaysia, uh, I think maybe Indonesia, the uh, Philippines, even Taiwan, who all say, look, we actually own 12 nautical miles or 200 nautical miles of the South China Sea off our coast. China has stepped in and saying, no, you don't. We own everything that we're drawing our line around, period. And that's that, period. Now, I remember them saying this five or 10 years ago. China was making this claim saying, hey, look, historically, the South China Sea historically belongs to China. No one really knows why they started saying this. Because uh, look at the map. The South China Sea is very appropriately named because it's a sea that's entirely south of the southernmost point of China. So it's not even off their coast. It's, it's way south of them. But China says, hey, historically, we've controlled the trade here and we've controlled everything. And guess what? We're counting it as part of our territorial waters and we don't care. Now, they were saying it with a not much nicer tone 10 years ago, and they were still being kind of nice about it five years ago. But I'm telling you, in 2015 and now 2016, China is saying, it's ours, shut up about it. And all of these surrounding countries are going to the United Nations. And remember, all those countries are also in ASEAN. And they get together in ASEAN meetings and say, what are we supposed to do about this? For its part, the United States routinely flies B-52 bombers around the South China Sea. I got you again. And the United States says, hey, look, dudes, um, the South China Sea is like an international waters situation. And it's a heavily trafficked trade lane by like every country on planet Earth, at least all the Asian ones and Pacific ones. You guys can't own it or control it. And so the United States routinely also flies around it, but sends military ships around it. The United States is saying, hey, look, we're protecting this for everybody. This is international. China can't claim it. This has become a very, very big deal. Big deal like this. I don't know about the, uh, the Senkaku uh, Daiyu Island debate. That might come to blows. Doubtful, though. This one might. This Spratly Island debate could very well turn into a full-fledged international conflagration or full-on war. Now, World War III war? I don't think so. But I have a feeling people are going to get shot and ships are going to get sunk in the South China Sea before this is settled. And it's never going to make everybody happy. Somebody's going to end up very unhappy with this mess. Because China has gone so far now as to say, well, we own it all and we're going to start proving it. 
So it, it, there, it, it's a sea that has a bunch of shallow reefs, especially down south or uh, off the coast of Brunei and Philippines. And so uh, the Chinese for the last five years, maybe longer, have been building on it, literally going down and building islands. If there's any little sort of rock outcrop there, I don't know what they're doing, but like taking gravel and sand down there and they're building islands in the South China Sea to then stick a Chinese flag on it. And if they can build a big enough one, then they're putting down an airstrip and calling it a Chinese airbase. And then they can say, well, guess what, friends? This is sovereign Chinese territory. It's got a flag in it. We can defend it 12 nautical miles in all directions. They are also patrolling the waters with more and more Chinese warships. And they are starting to get in fracases with Filipino and Vietnamese fishermen. And you heard it here first. The Vietnamese are the ones that are going to start something because the Vietnamese are a scrappy lot, man. No, you don't want to mess with the Vietnamese. And China and Vietnam have gone at it before. They're likely to go at it again because Vietnam says, hey, look, the Paracel Islands are ours. We don't give a crap what China says. And the Vietnamese regularly send out Vietnamese fishermen out there to float around and bump up against Chinese war vessels. So this could get hot, and it could get hotter sooner than later. Building islands. The Chinese also for years have taken pregnant Chinese women down to these makeshift islands and had them squat and, and knock a kid out, and they'd be like, oh, look, Chinese person here. A Chinese person was born on this rock, therefore... This must be Chinese territory now. <laughs> Doing, having babies and putting flags down, who knows if this really is any legitimate claim on territory. But a much more aggressive and much more powerful China that's really beefing up its navy, they can make a point of proving sovereignty over this area if they want to. And it increasingly looks like they want to. That's what I want you to know. Chinese military uh, has been conducting war games in the disputed South China Sea in 2014, 2015. They'll continue doing that in 2016. As I always suggest, the U.S. flies some B-52 bombers around the area every now and again just to make sure the Chinese know that, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, we're here too, and we're not conceding this territory from the rest of the world to you, not willingly. And uh, back in the summer, I'm sorry, it was fall of 2015, uh, a U.S. battleship accidentally got really, really close to one of the Spratly Islands, fabricated islands that the Chinese had built. That caused some consternation as well. And the United States was like, oh, what? what? We didn't know where we were. Whoops, sorry. So the U.S. continues to do that, again, in an effort to not just piss off China, but to keep these waterways open for the international community, a move which all of the surrounding countries support the United States to do, uh, even further afield like New Zealand and India and Australia. They all say, yes, we kind of, we like the U.S. is doing that. It infuriates China. So you have a collision between the world superpowers over this South China Sea thing. Australia is routinely asked by the United States to also send up ships, to send up surveil surveillance craft. And they do. And sometimes the Chinese bust them and say, hey, we don't, you got to ask permission to be here. And, and Australia and other entities are saying, no, we're following the U.S. lead on this. Again, watch for the Vietnamese angle on this one because they will throw down. I'll also offer this. Uh, that It's related to China. It's definitely related to this area, but it's more about the United States. Look for, here in the early 21st century, in the coming years, look for most of these Southeast Asian states to walk a very delicate line of not wanting to tick off China, but also wanting to have the United States present as a counterweight, as a check to grow China's growing strength militarily in the region. So I'm predicting you're going to see more U.S. Uh, bases, military bases in Australia. And guess what? The first one actually opened up in Northern Australia about three or four years ago. Australia has never, never uh, uh, hosted a U.S. military base. They do now. New Zealand is covertly getting one. I heard about that a couple of years ago. And I'm predicting that U.S. bases, U.S. military bases will return to the Philippines. The U.S. used to have bases there. They're gone. I think the, the Philippines is going to invite them back. I predict Vietnam will invite the United States of America to open a naval port in their country. How crazy is history? 
that's going to happen, and all this is going to happen again because all these countries and others want to maintain a U.S. influence in the region. China wants to do the exact opposite, and that's what's leading me to finish this up with this. All of this watery conflict uh, and conflict in the making is based on the concept of what's now being referred to as the first island chain strategy or the first and second island chain strategies. Here's a map of the first and second island chains uh, of China. Now, just a brief bit of history, this idea of the first and second and third island chain is actually, I believe, an American invention. I think somebody wrote it up uh, in the, during the early Cold War back in the 1950s and 60s uh, as a line that the United States should strive to naval power based. Uh, be able to hold these lines, and that the first island chain line was that the U.S. should work to make sure that China and Russia, again, both of them were communists in the Cold War, that that first island chain would be held, that there would be uh, uh, no uh, uh, letting the Chinese or the Russians out of that kind of containment, if it came to war, that we'd be able to contain them at the first island chain, and that everything from the first island chain to the second island chain would be routinely patrolled by the United States. Got it? It's an idea that never really took on in America. Everybody's like, well, that's nice, but I don't think it was a, a uh, legitimized doctrine that was used. But some Chinese readers got a hold of it, and they have really embraced it. And so the Chinese military totally has a outlined first island chain and second island chain strategy. And let me tell you what it is. So the island chains, roughly, and you'll see different lines from different sources, but they roughly follow... Uh, the southern end of the Japanese island chain, uh, that Senkaku, Daeyu Islands, Taiwan, all the way over to the Philippines, and containing all of the South China Sea. And, I, and China, military policy now is that this island chain, this is our front, this is the fence. This is the fence around our front yard. This territory is ours, and there should be no foreign influence, no foreign military bases, no patrolling by the United States or its allies. There should be no naval vessels, no military vessels of any kind within our first island chain. And they're working really hard to build that. It's not done yet, obviously. They haven't settled the whole South China Sea issue for starters. Uh, they haven't reabsorbed Taiwan for second, although they probably will. Uh, and they're now debating over that East China Sea. Ah, 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 ah. Does that make sense now why they're claiming airspace over the East China Sea? Starting to see the picture here? So that first island chain is, in, in China's military mind, that's their front yard, that's theirs. And there ain't going to be no foreigners hanging out there, military ships or otherwise, without their permission. Does that make sense? The second island chain is all the way over to Guam, some would say Hawaii, is areas of the open ocean, of international waters that China wants to pretty much dominate and say, yes, we understand that the United States will be there, but we'll be there more. We'll have more vessels up to the second island chain. In times of war, we will dominate up to the second island chain, and the first island chain is not up for debate, it's ours. Does that make sense? So pay attention to this island chain strategy and also understand all of this is really soured relations between China and Japan uh, because Japan is not willing to let China get away with its first island chain strategy. In fact, Japan's now coming out and counteracting, saying, we have an island chain strategy too, and it's the same islands, and they're ours. We're pushing the Japanese Navy right on up to the Senkakus, buddy. So they're, they're counteracting with the same kind of game plan, and... They're trying to turn the tables on China. Probably the United States is all about it. It's like, yeah, wait, wait, nudge, nudge, go for it, uh, Japan. Also remember that Taiwan is going to be within this first island chain, but Taiwan still buys millions and millions of dollars worth of weapons from the United States. And also consider for the last time that the United States... Being the strongest military power on planet Earth still routinely patrols these waters and the airspace and says, we're not paying attention to what you're saying, China. China considers this basically an insult. Again, let me stress, a more assertive, aggressive China considers this an insult 
It considers that it's uh, that the U U.S. and its allies are trying to contain China, trying to surround it and keep it pinned in. And there's a certain logic to that. Uh, and it's not going to do it. It's saying, look, we're a world power. We don't have warships circling the California coast, and you're not going to do it to us either. So this is a new age for China. Are you starting to see now how this thing seven is unfolding right before our very eyes, where China is flexing, it's flexed its financial, it's flexed its economic, it's flexed those muscles. Now it's flexing real raw power. And it's probably going to go down big time in the South China Sea first. It's flexing its financial, uh, economic, political muscle by encouraging others to go along with its plans and not do stuff with the United States, let's say. And of course, it's military muscle outwards to the rest of the world, specifically to not be contained by the United States of America and its allies in the Western Pacific while increasing its alliances on land to expand its economic and military influence into the interior of the Asian, Eurasian continent. I haven't even referenced that. But China has been, under Xi Jinping, cozying up to Vladimir Putin's Russia and been inking lots of trade deals and energy deals. And even with Pakistan, they're helping build a big port facility there. Remember that Silk Road stuff I talked about last lecture? All that is happening in tandem with this flexing of muscle outward. This is pretty interesting stuff, right? It surely is a product of our times uh, and China's rise back into the world seats of power, a role that not only is it quite comfortable with, but it's honestly been in this position much longer than the United States or any of its Western allies ever were. Remember, China has been around for three to 4,000 years. Give it a solid two and a half to three, no matter what, okay? And what we're witnessing right now is the return to power by this Asian giant, but in this modern context with new players, new technologies out there in the 21st century that this new China is having to deal with. But they are dealing with it, and they have their national pride back, their confidence back, their muscle back, and President Xi Jinping is doing it more assertively than anyone has done in China for the last couple hundred to couple thousand years. She is the shizzle.